This is Terrible 70s Sci-Fi Madness. Friggin' 70s, man. Talk about a lot of social problems, dynas, confusion, and re-evaluation of conventions on every level of society, wrapped up and sold as the vague amalgam of a decade. I suppose that's why it's only fitting that films from that period came out as experimental as they did. Superfly. And I would say that sweaty, experimental phase, at least on the movie side, really didn't ebb until right about 81 or 82. But unlike a lot of other things, it started almost on the clock in 69-70. Case in point, 1971's Omega Man. Or as it's styled, Omega Mega Man. Which yes, did make me lol. Simon Belmont? Kid Icarus? Mega Man? Filmed in 1970, also starring Charlton Heston, and produced by the same producer behind Soul and Green, it is nominally an adaptation of the novel I Am Legend, by contributor to the original Twilight Zone, Richard Matheson, whose main premise is the loss of humanity, loneliness, and hatred. Where is everybody? So basically what I've been going through since COVID hit. Which is fitting as the book also deals with character Robert Neville, Neville! Carly. being the sole survivor of the pandemic, that turns people and corpses into vampires. The former being mostly rational, with the latter falling into the typical zombie archetype. Which is a distinction almost invisible to Robert, as he kills a lot of both indiscriminately. And as a result, the mostly rational vampire send a woman as a spy, who knocks him out after he tries to analyze her blood for the disease that turned everybody into vampires. They capture him, and he dies via suicide pill in a prison cell, with the vampires looking at him with the same hatred he looked at them with. Rationalizing that he will Detroit become legend to this new society just as vampires had been to his. There's a lot of fun stuff as the book tries to rationalize the fear of crosses, garlic, and zombies that it contains. Which, in a sense, it also helped to create, at least in how we recognize them today. Mostly thanks to John Romero taking a lot of inspiration from this book to create Night of the Living Dead. Overall, the book is interesting, but your investment in the actual story may vary, reportedly. With Omega Man, however, I found myself having almost the opposite experience, with the main story being the main thing that kept me guessing, and the technicalities being a bit off to the wayside. The movie starts off as your typical Last Man on Earth bit, with Charlton Heston as... just Neville, as far as I can tell, driving a red convertible throughout the deserted city of Los Angeles with the movie conveying the setting much better than Soil and Green did. It's 1977, and it's been three years since a respiratory disease brought on by a Russo-Chinese bioweapon has killed almost the entire US population. Hmm. Charlton Heston, who is revealed to be a former scientist, is immune to the virus as he injected himself with an experimental vaccine after a helicopter crash, living the dream of every gun-toting 20 to 30-something weirdo in the US as he's holed up in a self-sufficient house with a bunch of cars and guns. <laughs> having a bit of a neighborhood squabble with a group of people who got turned by the mutant strain of the bioweapon into lidetic light-sensitive albinos, led by a televangelist type Heston saw on TV when the pandemic started. We were warned of judgment. Well, here it is. Wait, I just realized Far Cry 5 essentially stole that premise wholesale. Huh, funny. Heston then comes across the first normal survivor he's seen in years, Lisa, who flees from him because he's essentially half-naked, hairy 70s man with gun. The Luddites then capture Heston, their leader Matthias, I'll see you in Spain, lads. holds a show trial, after which they just try to burn him because he's science man and art industry and science is bad. My current running film theory is that Matthias is just salty because he never heard back from Rapture. Lisa comes back and rescues him. She shows him a community of child survivors being led by Dutch, a former medical student, and Richie, her little brother, who for some time now has been progressing to an advanced stage of the mutated disease, which Heston cures after figuring that he can make another vaccine out of his own blood, saying that once he's up to it, they can do the same with Richie's blood, in hopes of them all becoming immune and thus being able to build a happy little colony. Richie then recovers, asks Heston if he wants to use the vaccine on the cold. And you don't think the serum would work for... tertiary cases. He calls them violent thugs, but is unsure. They're half dead right now. You know what, mister? You're hostile. At times you scare me more than Matthias does. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
then wanting to act on his own, Richie goes to Matthias's gang to tell them that they can be normal again. But because weird kooky cults have a reputation for being rational and understanding, they decline and send him on his way. Just kidding, they violently murder the boy. Which is the beat of the movie you can pinpoint with laser precision. Oh my god. Where the entire thing unravels and starts to crap its ugly 70s underwear. Which it continues to do in force, as without warning, the movie also gives Lisa late stage COVID and in the process takes away any agency from her. Literally turning her into a bumbling idiot over Matthias on a dime. And because of this giant contrivance, Charlton Heston gets impaled by a spear on the fugly fountain in his front yard, to which he does a Jesus pose, because that's also something the movie wants to go with. Cut to next morning, where Heston, who hasn't moved away from the fountain for some reason, gives Dutch and the kids an entire bottle with his blood as they drive away. The lame, inconclusive, unsatisfying 70s end. Let me tell you I really like this movie for the most part. Sure, a lot of it was stupid. Hmm. Miserable schmuck. But it was stupid in all the right ways for me. I liked it when it did the Last Man on Earth thing. I liked how it then managed to transition into exploitation territory a bit. Now put your hands out. Out! Way out by shoulder, I like to go crucify you, baby. Matter of fact, they were gonna roast me. I really liked that its dialogue had a bit of spice and moxie to it. Christ, you could save the world. Screw the world, let's save Richie. I thought the small little romance between Lisa and Heston was really sweet. Well, you know the uh, old song? If you were the only girl in the world and I were the only boy, okay. But I guess I'm the only boy. And I liked how it felt like a good counterpoint to Soylent Green. Are you ready for this? What is it? Birth control pill. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Neville manages to be a much more immediately likable character than Frank Thorne, with a lot more banter, character agency, and just funny quips throughout the movie. I didn't mind when they said fuck it and did their own thing with the source material, because a lot of it was simply... cool. And contrary to Soylent, they actually do their central premise justice. Critics have noted how it doesn't feel like a sci-fi movie, but I don't think that's bad. I think it allows the movie to stretch its I am legs and become a more small in scale and human bit of sci-fi. My favorite kind. Some of its standout moments for me are the opening, which they filmed on a Sunday morning in LA's Central Business District, which really was that empty. And it does a good job at tricking an unsuspecting audience that everything was chill until dropping all pretense. Even the notorious people driving in the background at the beginning kind of added something to that. I like to think it's just a guy driving on an average day and suddenly he drives by Rod Serling who says, The man you're following is about to become the leader for an odd group of people, only known as the last people on Earth. I don't know man, this movie just has something to it that makes it special. When Heston gets a flat tire, he breaks into a cobweb infested showroom and steals a Mustang, babbling while the corpse of the dealer just sits there. That's eerie in all the right ways. Then towards the end of the movie, they go into an abandoned hospital with decomposed corpses lying on hospital gurneys. That image really stuck with me, despite the silly drop-dead nature of how they presented the disease in the movie. Sure, it's not perfect, they took the otherworldly moral grayness of the book and boiled it down to a fight against unlikable kooky cult shitheads being led by funny bottom gear man, but it worked in favor of the surprisingly juvenile, free-spirited tone the movie mostly took on. And conversely, that's why those last 20 minutes just really didn't fit. For a movie that is so pleasantly progressive, feeling very loose and fresh with one of the first interracial kisses of American cinema, with the character specifically invented due to the then prominence of the Black Power movement, it's weird that they then do something so reactionary and just lobotomize her, then turning her off basically before rushing to an ending. Omega Man as a whole feels like it really encapsulates the times it was made in, and it's sad that it couldn't find a way to reconcile the residual free love, free spiritedness with a harsher, more downer, more mature tone that would characterize the 70s. Still, it's a decent take on its source material, and I still can't believe that both this and that Will Smith movie took from the same well on this one. Yeah. But I think that goes to show how many directions you can take a good idea.
Even Richard Matheson said he didn't mind Omega Man, since it was so removed from his material and did its own thing. Tim Burton loves this movie, although I don't know how much that counts for anymore. People might say that's why I've made some bad movies, because, you know, I, <laughs> those are the kind of movies I watched and enjoyed. I'm the trash man! And the Simpsons parody did that one time. So call me crazy, but with movies like The Suicide Squad out there, I think you could literally remake 80% of this movie the exact same way, and it would still hold up. If there's anything that really tanks this movie, it is just the ending and that Jesus stuff. Are you God? Let's find out if he's even a doctor first before we go promoting him, okay? But oh well, I hope the fates didn't judge the people behind this movie too much for that bit of blasphemy. What do you mean the director of this movie got partially decapitated by a helicopter blade a decade later and is now on Wikipedia's weirdest historical deaths list? Damn! Don't tempt fate, I guess.